Brain imaging has taught us a lot about ASS. The first thing it's done is it's provided something concrete. There's, it's very frustrating when a person has a condition, they go and get tests and the doctor says you're normal. And what they mean is there's nothing on the test I can see. It doesn't, normality is a complex thing. Most brain scanning is done by looking at structure. You look at the structure and the structure looks normal, but it tells you nothing about how it functions. Functional imaging is about looking at how it functions. And that's where we began, that's where we began the, the journey. What we've been able to do is show that there are particular regions of the brain, unsurprisingly, they're regions that are involved in vision. We already knew they were part of the visual cortex, so I don't surprise anybody. But they reproducibly have changes. They have more, they're more active, metabolism is increased. They're more connected to other parts of the brain. Their biochemistry that we can measure with something called spectroscopy is abnormal. And it all points to the same part of the brain. So we're starting to hone in on it, uh, if you like, hone in on the structures, they're mostly in the visual cortex, that seem to be different in visual snow syndrome. The differences we're seeing are increased metabolic activity, so they're more turned on. They're more connected to to areas that are, in, that are involved in how we perceive, how we perceive, how the world is perceived to us, you might say. And importantly, we're starting to see changes in their connections with other parts of the brain that are mapped and correlated with particular neurochemicals. And one of the most important of those, it turns out, is serotonin. What we've seen with the, a new technique with functional imaging, that, uh, a piece of work that Francesca Paletta has led on, collaborated with uh, Ottavia Di Pasquale and Steve Williams in the imaging group at King's, is particular subclass of what serotonin acts at. So chemicals in the brain act at a place called a receptor. It's a bit like a lock and key system. Serotonin comes on and it turns in the lock. And for serotonin, there are 14 different locks. And actually there are some subgroups and you could probably get it up to about 20 or more. It's a lot of locks. It turns out that there's only one lock that's involved with the serotonin story in this particular part of the brain that's different in people with visual snow. So we're already starting to look probably in the right lock that we want to change. It's important to say that when I talk about functional imaging, I'm talking about group differences. We haven't got to a point yet where we could do a test to look at serotonin transmission, uh, anything with the uh, MRI with spectroscopy or, or blood flow. So unfortunately, it's not something we can roll out in the clinical practice. There's still nothing better than a, than a history. It's at a level where we can use it to look at a population problem and try and understand the way forward. Unfortunately, we can't use it for diagnosis just at the moment because the signals are too small. You have to average them up to get above all the other things that are happening in the brain. The brain's a pretty busy place. We've thought quite a lot about and looked quite hard for triggers for visual snow. Clearly, many of the recreational drugs will trigger visual snow, particularly the ones that interact with serotonin, unsurprisingly, because that's turned up on the biology story. So things like, um, like LSD, will in, interact with uh, serotonin systems. That's been known forever as well. So it's not, doesn't bowl me over to find out that hallucinogenic uh, drugs or um, some psychedelics will aggravate or be the first thing that activates visual snow. So we strongly advise uh, against them. Patients will tell me about various things, various head trauma, for example, or other events in their life. But things happen. And I don't, there's not much which gets above, I think, broad experience. So I listen to what everyone's got to say, you know, that's how it all got started, and we write it all down. Nothing apart from drug use, so to speak, and that includes cannabinoids, uh, marijuana, for example, can cannabis. They're the sort of things, things that alter the, that al uh, alter the psyche, so to speak, are things that one would want to avoid. And if you've got visual snow, it's a really bad idea to try and test the devil and make it worse. That's certainly true. It's a, it's a problem because we, can't, we don't yet know in 
whom that consumption is going to produce it. So we have to advise everyone that that's a, that's a bad idea. Happily, that pharmacology, that drug aspect of understanding things does feed into how we begin to think about understanding the treatment. So if you know what is bad, you can understand what you need to block and what is good. One other thing that we've noticed with in terms of triggers and, and treatments is that most things that are thrown at people with visual snow, A, don't work and are more likely to make things worse than not. So things like antidepressants can make things worse. And what's the big surprise there? The antidepressants work through serotonin mechanisms. If you start to put the picture together, it's not random. There's nothing, there's really not much in medicine that's random, there's just not understanding. And once you understand it, it all fits into a picture. So we, um, the reality of life is that for most people with visual snow, they really should avoid most types of uh, medicines that, in, that interact with what are called biogenic amines like serotonin or, or noradrenaline. There are certain chemicals that are well and widely reported to produce a syndrome like visual snow. And it's certainly true that I've seen many patients who've taken those drugs and ended up with visual snow. Now I'm adducing the cause. I think it's reasonable because the serotonin antidepressants can worsen the problem and take people who've never had any experience of those and do the brain imaging with the looking at the transmitters, you get to the same serotonin story. And I'm just, I'm just joining the dots up and they look pretty solid. I know that if I understand the biology, I'll know the direction of that. I'll know the direction of how to improve it. And it's an iterative process. I mean, 20 years ago, people didn't accept the problem that existed. At the moment, it is frustrating. It's a little frustrating for me. I'm sure it's frustrating for everyone who's interested in the problem. We don't precisely know. There's a lot of work to be done, but we're doing it.